Welcome to Skelda. My name is Joe Austin. And for those who haven't took part in the Skelda program before, Skelda is a joint production with the Phil and Fubble and also the Vulture Fears to Hear. And our aim is quite simple. We aim to, to entertain and to inform. And we have a series and had a series of, of guests from across the west of the city and farther afield. And our guest today is as interesting as all of those, in fact, interested, more interesting than lots of them. We are with Deirdre Walsh today, who's the director of the White Rock Children's Centre. So Deirdre, welcome to Skilda. Hi, Joe. Thank you very much for inviting me along. I'm delighted. We are delighted to have you. The idea of Skilda is that for those who listen to the program, that they leave the program knowing a wee bit more about the individual, uh, not necessarily knowing more about what the individual does, but knowing more about who the individual is. Okay. So I want to start, and if you would start with me and bear with me, your name is known in the west of the city, broadly, and it's widely known, but what isn't known about you is who is Derby Welsh. So tell me a bit about you. Okay, um, I'm not for starting the age, that will really depress me. Um, I live just off Black's Road in Brook. I'm married with two children and one um, grandson who is the life and soul of our life now. Um, married to a man called Martin Walsh, um, who was originally from down around um, Beach Mount, around that area. I'm originally from down the Ampton Coast, just outside Glenarm, um, and I have lived now in Belfast for, do you know what, I was counting this up last night, it's going to be nearly 40 years that I've lived here um, in the city. So you're a blow-in? I'm a blow-in, yes. And we're grateful that you came our direction. <laughs> um, where were you educated? Where did you go to school? I went to St Congal School in Larne and um, then um, I, I left school again with, um, I wasn't interested in education, I left school with a number of, um, it was CSCs then, no, no GCSEs or anything like that and um, I moved up to Belfast whenever I was 17 and um, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. I moved in with a number of girls around the Holy Land and I um, couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I got a job in the Erigal Inn as um, a kitchen assistant and I really loved that doing that there. The two chefs we worked with were great and it was a great experience. I then decided that I couldn't decide whether I wanted to do nursing or childcare. So I worked at in Musgrave Park Hospital for a year as an auxiliary nurse. And that was real, real, real hard work. Um, after that, I, that year, gave me the insight that there's no way I wanted to be a nurse. Um, and I decided to go back to college and work part time. And I went back to college and done childcare training. And then um, I got my first job out of college. And I worked in, at the prison at Crumlin Road in the visitor centre and worked there for 11 years working um, through some pretty hairy times, um, dealing with families who were going through the prison and going through the courts. We looked after children and worked with the, the women and the families um, through lots of really hard times and seeing the break up of loads of families and the heartache um, that loads of families went through during the conflict. And I stayed there until the, um, the prison and the court closed. How does a, a, a young, I'm sure, innocent country woman it lands in the middle of Belfast, in the middle of the worst conflict uh, for hundreds of years in Ireland? Did you find it hard? Was it a lonely place? Was it hard for you to adjust? No, I, I think I was young and I was silly, and I really didn't... Um, I really didn't think about it. It must have been really traumatic for my, my parents whenever I think back on it. Um, but I didn't really think about it. You just, the Holy Land, living in the Holy Land, it was a different world. Even though, um, even though you were, um, 
the, 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 the troubles were at their height, but the Holy Land wasn't hit the same student area. It wasn't uh, affected the same way. It was only whenever I went to work in Crumlin Road that I saw the real, the real suffering and the real pain and um, the breakup of families and just everything that went along with that and all the heartache that went along with that. And it, 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 that was more of an insight, but you just grew with it because um, anybody that's ever went to the visitor centre in the Crumlin Road, it was, it was an area that nobody ever touched. It was the only, only area that never was touched by anybody. Everybody came into it from, I don't know, um, from uh, Joe Austin maybe to um, Jordy Seawright, um, you, you name it, everybody came into the centre. There was never, ever, ever anything ever, ever happened at the centre in all my years working there. It was you know, through all the supergrass trials, um, Budgie Allen, different supergrass trials that we worked through. But people, even though they were from different sites, the dairy bus used to come up three or four times a week. And it was like a, I don't know what you would call it, it wasn't a fantasy word because it was horrendous, but it was a safe haven for people from either side for women and children to come into. And it, it gave me a great insight into life and um, and the people who who suffer an awful lot and who don't have um, who have good family infrastructures, and I think that that has sort of broken down now. And I I I learned a lot from that. Well, it made interest to you that when I was doing some research about who is the real Dirty Welch, well, the real Dirty Welch stand uh -huh. up as opposed to the person that we know who works on the white track. The people remembered you during that period, a very difficult period, in that room, yep. in those rooms rather, in the crumb. And you're right, they said it was it was a neutral haven where people were treated unusually for that particular prison. People were treated with a bit yep. of dignity and a bit of respect. What you haven't mentioned, you've mentioned your mother and father, brothers and sisters. I have two brothers and they're both married, they still live down there. Obviously my parents are dead now. My two brothers still live down there and they have their own families. One of them works for the forestry and the other works for um, uh, Fix and Lorries, a commercial company. And uh, their, their kids are there as well. But, but once your parents die, there's not the same, we would go down maybe two or three times a year and they come to me, we're close. But there's not the same, the same links there now that um, my mum and daddy aren't there anymore. You said about the identification with the people who were going to on their visits in the crumb and the preparation yeah. for later work that you undertook. And, and yeah. do you think that it was a bedrock? Did it give you a ground and, and understanding it, it, people been people? It gave me a total understanding. Whenever I left Crumlin Road, I just came straight to the White Rock. And um, the White Rock then was an absolutely booming college. That's over 20 odd years ago. It, it's where most people in working class areas like the White Rock and West Belfast got their first experience of um, re-entering formal education again. My own husband went back again through Belfast. Um, then it was, um, then it, and also you have to remember, we're in a building called St Thomas's, where I have grown men who tell me horror stories whenever they come in here about their experience of there. So going back to the college was, um, for some of them it was difficult because they had horrific experiences in here. Um, and this place was booming whenever I came here. We set up, I was involved along with Maura Brown and Jane Craven and people like that. Um, they had set up a crash here and we came and it enabled the women um, to go back to education. And um, I mean, lots of people come through here. Lots and lots of people got their qualification. Lots of people went on to university and we were able to, to um, provide somewhere for them to bring their kids at, at a limited cost and it enables so many of um, our generation now, people in their 60s, 50s and 60s, that they haven't had that opportunity to have childcare and it's something we've always advocated for to allow women, especially back in the education, you must have childcare. 
to enable any of them to get back into education. It's always that extra burden for them. I want to I want to touch on that part of your of your role, but just let me remind those who have just joined us that you're listening to Skelta. My name is Joe Austin, and Dirty Welch is our guest. And Skelta is a production, a joint production of Phil and Fubble and uh, Phil uh, uh, and Fubble, sorry, and Falcha Fears to Hear. So that that idea, which is commonplace now, that we that we would take for granted almost, given all the difficulties, but nevertheless, that women could go back to education, that there was a, there was somewhere where children uh, could be looked after while that was happening. It was quite a revolutionary idea at the time in working class. It may have been commonplace in middle class areas, but in working class areas, what were some of the difficulties that you faced? Um, well, always financing, always regulations. It was whenever the, um, I came here, I have came from a, a, a very structured organization, Save the Children Fund, run, I was employed by them. They, there was plenty of money around them. There was, even though it was tough times in the visitor center, but there was, there was loads of things around it. Um, there was a whole safety net around it. And whenever I came here, money was always going to be the issue. To be able, to, you had to have properly qualified staff. You had to have, you had to follow regulations, which is completely right. And we all, and we all, um, there's very, very little government funding to support that. The the Biffy crashes was made up of um, the the three settings in East and Shankill and here in the White Rock, and then we we decided that an opportunity came up to build, a, to go into partners that was to John's GA, and we were able to build a purpose-built daycare for students and for working parents. Um, and that was a new concept for West Belfast as well. And always the struggle has been, the, the social economy model is fine if you are working in an area of, um, what would you say, um, like financially very, very viable people in it. In the white rock, we we didn't have that there, so we had to market our service that would meet the needs of the women who were coming and the families who were coming, and also be able to pay staff a decent wage for doing a really really hard job looking after our people's children to give them the best start in life. We it's a massive responsibility that's never ever advertised as widely as formal education. So it was, it's always been, and I've been here now 21 years, and the struggle hasn't got any less. It's really, really tough for people, women still in areas, working class areas, to be able to avail of good quality childcare and be able to meet the cost of it. It's always going to be an issue for them. Someone told me when I was doing the research for, for this interview that your heart was broken every week, that there wasn't a week that my time that you hadn't got a kind of, of a horror story that you had to resolve and that must have took its toll on you it has taken its toll on me over the years but you know any community worker you talk to out there their heart is broken and loads of times trying to keep a service going and we we say we're here and we have gone through a number of crises we've had to pay off people and and that is a really really hard Thing to do because we trained people up, we brought them into this profession, and then as hard times came, we've had to pay people off. At, at this stage now, um, we, we have a good organisation. We're steady. We're not in any way overly comfortable, but we're we're moving into a new phase, and um, then that all came to a halt, obviously, COVID nineteen. But every single day, it's a stress trying to keep here going. But see the satisfaction you get. We, we offer a number of services out there to families and children. Um, we're funded by a number of different funders. We continually meet people who are worse off than me, much worse off than me, who are making the best of life and really, really been out there um, sacrificing every single day. So. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't like to, it's tough running here, but I'm not a victim. I love here every minute I'm here because I have a great team of people to work with and a good management committee and a good people around me. I want to move on, I want to move on to the team because I know some of them are hiding in the curtain. Do you support 
or to shout it at me. And um, but one of the things again that I, in, in trying to put this together was the number of people told me that they were glad that you didn't take the, the advice that you were given by well-meaning friends to move on, to get another job, that it was too difficult, that you'd done your, your bit, you'd served your time. Do you ever regret that you never took that advice? Well, where else would it go? You know, uh, um, this place is, um, and it's been my family's life as well, well this is a, a brilliant organisation. I have a team of 22 staff here. Every one of them have been here, besides a new people, have been here like with me for 15, 16 years. So that's always a good sign whenever your staff stay with you. People that work here have come from this community as well. They've got qualifications. Um, why would I want to move on to something else that is an easier, an easier job? I match up. Well, I could. Um, I always joke that whenever this is all over, I'm going to stack shelves in Sainsbury's. But now with uh, coronavirus, I'm really glad I didn't make that move because I think I would be a more dangerous place to be at the minute. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy. I think every job is stressful, life stressful. And one of the things that I hope comes out of this whole really awful, awful, awful time is the people commercial world we live in um, and look at um, how, how this should change your life because people are losing family members. And see, at the end of the day, your family is the backbone of everything. And if you lose any of them, you know, your whole life, and we aren't going to be able to mourn properly if we do lose family members, which is an Irish tradition, awake and, and, and proper mourning. And I just hope that out of this tragedy, that we all come out of this with a different insight and delight. And the pain and the, it's crazy. If you don't have your health, you don't have any wealth. We were getting ready for this interview. And I have to tell those who are listening that you were very reluctant uh, to to do it. Not not that you didn't want to talk about the work. You were a bit concerned that it it would be only about you and not about the project. And of course, since we have started talking, you've talked about everybody else but you. But you you paint a picture of a project that looks after families, but itself is a bit like a family. Is is that a fair assessment of? Of how Absolutely. It, it, it is a family and we care about each other and we have lost, even in that period of time, we've lost staff um, and, that, and that's also to illness as well and all, everybody cares about each other. We're not like, we're not lovely dobbies. Um, I'm sure there's loads of days that we are annoyed and there's had to be situations where people have had to be, have been in trouble, have been disciplined, but there's a lot the minute we have no men working here, and that's just the way the child care field falls. But people really, really care about each other. They care about the families that come in here. Um, and, and we, for a long time, the centre has very quietly done things. Like we, have, we, we welcome newcomers um, to West Belfast. We have had a, been doing this work for nearly going into 13 years now, welcoming the newcomer families here. And they have taught us so much about hardship and about the kind of lives that some of them have came from and, and their experience of real hardship that none of us will ever really understand. Um, we also um, work with some families in the area who are living, at, still in this day and age, we have families who are living in extreme poverty, um, who, who the majority of us, if, if we're honest, only um, you just live from one pay packet to another if you're lucky enough to have a job. And some of the guests has really highlighted the need to um, to look at the luxury that we, it's made us, at the minute I have five staff here because we have had to, and to ensure that I'll have enough money to, um, to pay the staff, we've had to furlough staff, all the childcare staff off. And there's five of us here working on a food bank. And this is work that's not new to us. We've been doing this for years, you know, providing food parcels for newcomer families, local families, all very discreetly. 
and we do a thing called the Christmas Appeal, which initially started off with 50 people um, that we supported. This year, we supported over 300 children. Um, and that is the only way we can do that is we put out an appeal and people take on a child and they support them. And it's the same at the minute. Um, while this is all going on, people are coming to us. I just had a, a phone call from somebody to tell me she had transferred. She lives in England. Her family are from Ballymurphy. Um, I'll not mention her name because she probably wouldn't want any publicity. She just transferred. Her heart's always been Ballymurphy. She's lived in London for years and she sent me £200 to buy food for the, the food bank. And we, we continually get that. There are so many people out there who help and don't want any fuss about it and give us money continually, not masses of money, but take help families who are in need. And that really, that's what keeps me here. That's what gives me insight into the, the kindness and, 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 and the goodness of people out there, especially in West Belfast. That's the very reason why we, we decided that we would ask you and pursue you to get this interview because a lot of the work that you don't that you do sorry it's private a lot of it is unknown i want to just maybe touch a bit one aspect of the work that you undertake the new citizens those who come to belfast fleeing yep. conflict around the world fleeing injustice and all of that for many of those families the people who work with you in the center are their only friend in the world they're here with no family they're here looking at a facialdom, a facialdom from the society that came in quite often means oppression. How, how do you begin to, to make that connection, that bond? I mean, sometimes yeah. the language is not there. Sometimes, the, obviously, the culture is different. So how do you, how do you reach out, and mainly so, how do you reach out to the families? Well, we initially we went into this. Um, we went into this twelve years ago with the health visitor we worked with. There was no great big plan put in place. It was a group of Chinese women who were living, who were all asylum seekers, who were living in a house in the Springfield Road, and we were approached to see if we could do something for them. And to be honest, um, it really was the blind leading the blind. They had no English, and obviously, not any of us um, was very au fait. With companies or Mandarin, so we 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 contacted them. We invited them into the centre. There was a lot of smiling and laughing and and uh, making an interaction with people. But we were able to show them something that made them um, want to come back to us. We sought out funding, and then um, we were able to appoint a worker. And now that is a big part of our work. The, most people, are, they find us or other organisations find us and they contact us to, for any newcomers who are coming into the West. And we work along with Belfast City Council, other providers, the Migrant Forum. We get referrals from all kinds of places. And it, it, the good thing is we have funding here to be able to provide childcare, which means that their children, and there's lots of these families, um, family is. Um, we've talked. Uh, we talked to some of the families, and they their family values a bit like ours. Maybe fifty years ago, the family unit is, you know, that it's very, very, very important to them. Their children are the most important thing in their life, and we have to look at, um, you know, their culture. But we also have to teach them about living here because we don't want them to get in trouble. We offer English classes. We offer food parcels, but they also have so much to give our community. They have so much to give us. So we, we learn from them every day. We learn about their religion. We learn, we have discussions, open discussions about um, uh, being a Muslim or a Hindu or, you know, a Christian and what it means to them. And it, it's sometimes it's the, the, the conversation is, Something that we haven't addressed here sometimes is Protestant and Catholic. It's a whole new concept and it's been a learning experience. We have staff here, obviously, and as you know, with Basque. We have a Polish worker. We have an Indian staff member. We had an Italian girl. So we, as a, we're a multicultural centre as well as everything else. And it's just part of our, it's nothing different. 
you know, we just accept and we offer English classes and we offer cookery and we offer food. And they also meet local women through our friendship club who um, link in together and they learn from each other. And it's been really, really, not everything's rosy for them. See, if I lived in five pound odds a day, it's, it's a hard, hard life for them. And we worry about a lot of them especially during this stage, because they are they, and they are very, very good at following the rules about isolation. They follow up very well because many of them have seen um, pandemics before. They have seen illnesses. They have seen things, you know, Ebola and different diseases that we have no experience of. So we have a lot to learn from them over that. I think you've said three times in a, in a brief period of time that we have so much to learn. And I think it is, that is the key to how we engage with our new citizens. Because many of them are now the way the Irish have been for generations, Latin in New York or Latin in Canada or Australia, that if people only give those who come to see us the chance, we can all learn. It's a learning process for us all. So let me just remind the listeners who we are and what we're doing. My name is Joe Austin, the program you're listening to Skilda, and my guest is Gerdry Welch, who is the director of the White Rock Children's Centre. So we've covered how you got here, we've covered a wee bit what you do here, we've covered all the fights that go on with the staff and how they beat each other up, well, I'm only joking, how they get on with each other. So I want to just, I want to cover two parts of ICON. First of all, I, I never thought in my lifetime that I would see food banks in any working class area, harsh and all as the conditions are, but food banks is something that goes back to nearly the Victorian era. How essential are the food banks that you that you organize and that you distribute? I mean, is it a matter of somebody's actual food? Um, well, it's, it, it can be a matter of their food. Obviously, it's in, in the food we have been using, um, people like Tony Macon in the food bank, and, and we use Fair Share and different organisations that got there for a long time. It can, it's mostly people's essentials, um, that they, they have basic, the basics there. But, it, I mean, people can um, need a food bank for any reason, it could be somebody losing their job. Before this all happened, it could have been somebody losing their job. It could be they, their benefit has been cut because nobody, nobody, nobody has any surplus of, of money. Uh, well, very few people have any surplus of money. I know there's a few rich people out there, but there's, they really live from week to week or month to month. And the, the need for the food banks at the minute we, since this has started, we have given out over 300 parcels um, to people who we never would envisage that we would be giving out parcels to. See, as we come to the end of this month, and um, people are, oops, there'll be a new, a whole new set of people that will require help. People who have worked and maybe are now have been furloughed out of their job, they'll only get 80% of their wages. They'll have their children in the house all day long and they will really hit them hard. We anticipate over the next, it's been a gradual um, given out of food recently because we, we have experience of it over a number of years, but I imagine over the next couple of months as people's money starts to drop down, um, as people, um, as things get tighter, we anticipate that we will have more, more people requesting help from us. And not just elderly, families are really, really going to find this very, very difficult. If they're not um, in school, they're having to find two or three meals a day for children. And, and that seems crazy saying that, in, in, as, as we're part of one of the, the richest countries in the world, but it is there in our doorstep and it will continue on for a long time. I don't anticipate it going away anyway, anytime soon. I know you don't curse, or at least you say you don't curse. So we'll take well, you. Like a tripper, but I'm not going to do it, Mark. <laughs> uh, well, of course. Um, but when this pandemic hit, when the lockdown came, when you're looking at at meager resources, knowing that you're going to be on the front line, knowing that whatever's came before you, nothing has prepared you for this. Did you not feel like saying, 
whatever that bad talk you use is, was it not just a kind of your heart sinking moment? Your heart does sink because my heart did sink because I, I, I get really angry. Ireland is an island. And I really, really got angry that we, we it should have been an all island, nothing to do with politics, an all island approach. Because there's a sea between us and England, but the, you know that Ireland should have been looked at as one whole island, nothing to do with politics. There should have been better procedures put in place. But there was nothing shocked me. We live under we live under a Tory government who who will never, ever, ever have any concept of needing a food bank, who will never, ever, ever know what it's like to work long shifts, who have no concept of this whole thing. And Boris getting um, COVID-19 about a man in the area who is on a ventilator here, it will be his, his whole experience of it, it will be completely different. Not that you'll get any less of service, because the National Health Service we have is something that we all out of this should be on the streets fighting for because we have the best, best health service in the world, even though sometimes people complain, sometimes people abuse it. But I myself was ill at the start of this and end up in the matter. And this is not a pity thing. It's just to say, CC and the staff who were there, thankfully it wasn't anything serious, but seeing how dedicated they were and my husband's been sick for a number of years of different things and being in hospital. Our National Health Service is something that we should all be out really singing from the rooftops about how wonderful they are and how dedicated they are. And, you know, we, we really have to look at this whole thing as an All-Ireland. Dirty, you'll be surprised, I know, because we've been talking for four minutes but just to kind of conclude and round off this interview and again thank you for doing it and I know you're you're, you're up to your eyes and the staff who I know are hiding behind you I, uh, are, are working away they're away getting parcels ready they're very good they're getting their parcels ready to go out very, very good very good but tell us from a practical sense is there anything that the community who watch this program by the way is there anything the community one should be aware of, and two can do to help, and three, how do we pick up the pieces after this pandemic is over? Um, well, again, I've said um, I don't want I want people to stay indoors and stay safe and look after their own families. I want us all to come out of this. Um, as safe as possible and I just want to remind people we are all in this together and um, not the, the, the way it's been portrayed there is um, ordinary people who are trying to do their best and then there is um, the, the British establishment that are telling us to go one way and my advice is that follow the regulations that say stay indoors, don't party. I know it's hard, but it would be harder if you end up in the hospital. So just follow the regulations. If there's anybody out there that knows any family who are maybe um, having difficulty, but too embarrassed to maybe ask for help, please try and persuade them to. Don't sit in isolation um, with no food or, or no, nobody helping you. Contact us. We are willing to help anybody in this area who needs support with food. Deirdre, on those words of wisdom and those that act of kindness, uh, on behalf of Falcher Fierce to Hear, on behalf of Phil and Fubble, on behalf of me and Skilda, I want to thank you for the interview. I want to thank you and your staff for all the work that you have been doing and will continue to do. I know you didn't want to do the interview, but I'm very glad that you did. So from me to you, Goramila Mayogat, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bye. Stay safe.